Yeah. See. Backwards. Um, and, and, and I was looking uh, through that. Corner. And it really okay. gives great and this blanks the slide out. If you if you hit that by mistake, just hit it again. It comes back. Okay. Products, uh, very useful information. That's good. No problem. Yeah. Hey, and by the way, if you guys haven't seen Ron's presentation and Kurt's presentation with the NCBA, the stockmanship stewardship deals, you're missing. Uh, it's a treat. So. There's a lot to be learned from those guys, a lot of experience, and I'm, I'm super glad he's here. I, you know, Kurt's a good friend, Rod's a good friend. They're both excellent speakers, and we appreciate it. So, so Chris is always like, send me your presentation. I've got to see slides. So I said, well, I'm, I threw it back on him. I said, you send me what you want me to talk about. These are the slides he sent. Uh, look at the old longhorn and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a mule. So like, really? What's the deal? But multi-species, let me make sure I got this right. Multi-species fencing is what he wanted me to talk about. You have to have a plan. You have to know what you're fencing. Cattle, sheep, goats, horses, hogs, dogs, whatever. Elk, deer, you name it, you have to have a plan. A lot of people talking about wireless systems now where they're putting collars on cattle and you know, doing this type of thing. I, you know, I'm not really sold on it right yet. How do you keep the predators out? How do you do a lot of different things? How do you keep the neighbor stuff from getting in? I, I think it's probably interesting and it's probably something that'd be fun to play with, but I'm not so sure about it right yet. I've done a lot with Chris and everything that we stress is planning. You know, he's got the fence building uh, demos next week where you actually learn how to build fence. Most of that is planning what to do, where to put it, what you're going to be trying to accomplish. And so there's a lot more to it than just going out and driving the first fence post. We all have fences. Sometimes they just need to be upgraded. You know, you've got fences that stuff gets through. You know, horses, cattle, sheep, goats, you can't ever keep them in. Yes, you have to upgrade them. So you couldn't put goats in that fence right there. It would not work. Sheep. One thing about it, predators could get in, which is what you don't want. So we have a lot of good fences, but some of the things we need to do, maybe we need to add to it. You have to consider all your options. You have to, when you're planning a system, these are the things you need to do. You gotta lay out the area you wish to fence on graph paper. And so I go out and help people a lot, but I like to walk on the farm. I want, I want to put boots on the ground because I don't know exactly what those layouts are north facing slopes, south facing slopes, water systems. I want to know all that stuff before I start laying things out. You have to include your gates, your bracing, your line post. Are you going to use wood or are you going to use steel? You have to consider your water sources, your feeding and working facilities like Ron was talking about, catch pens and lanes. All those things have to be figured out. When we start talking about multi-species, what type of fence and where should it be used? Should it be fixed knot? Should it be electric? Is it perimeter? Is it interior? All those things have to be considered. What kind of animals am I going to have? Of course, we're talking about cattle right now, but a lot of people are running sheep and goats with them. So there's a lot of different critters that can be added into that system. Do I need predator control or do I need to be wildlife friendly? If you've got sheep and goats, you have to keep the predators out. So it's not only keeping stuff in, it's keeping stuff out. Do I want to incorporate electric fence, which I would. Would that be offsets, permanent cross fence, or poly wire? We were just talking about strip grazing. That's usually poly wire. So all those things have to be considered. Containment or exclusion. So do you want to keep stuff in, or do you want to keep stuff out? Or do you want to do both? And that's something right now that people struggle with. You know, they've got good fences, but they can't keep stuff from getting in that they, don't, that, that, that they don't want in. So you have to look at those two situations right there. And that's very, very important on multi-species fences. You have to select the proper fence fabric. There's a lot of fence out there today that's good and also not so good. We hardly ever recommend low tensile products anymore, and we'll get into that in just a second, because they sag and bag, and they, they stretch up to 11%, so when you get impact on them, they just don't come back. 
so it really messes up your fencing systems. So what are you trying to keep in or out? Is there going to be a lot of pressure from the inside or the outside? Will the, be, will the fence be used for multiple species, which is what we're talking about? Perimeter fence, cross fence, or catch pens. All those different deals have to be fenced differently. You can't use the same product for all those three uh, scenarios. Pens need a tighter weave and closer post bags. And so if you're putting pressure on something like Ron said, if you're putting pressure on them, it puts pressure on your fences. Some of the fences we build nowadays can't take that pressure. So we have to pick the right material. For perimeter fences, like if you're in the back 40, you can use a more open weave, like with fixed knot, which we'll talk about in a second, and wider post spacings. When you put pressure on stuff, the weave needs to be tighter and the posts should be closer together. So there's a lot of the different things to consider when you start fencing. Terrain, winter conditions, summer conditions, all that stuff goes into considering, I mean, when you're planning a fence, that's what you need to look at. If you're using electric fence, proper energizer selection is the most important. If you incorporate offsets, cross fence, whether permanent or temporary, those things need to be considered when you buy an energizer. The biggest problem with electric fence is not having enough horsepower. The fence is your hired hand, but must be laid out and built properly. So if you're by yourself, like Ron's talking about, in some of these scenarios, or like Greg brought up back here in the back with fencing, if I'm trying to move cattle or sheep or goats to my catch pens or to my working facilities, I need to use my fence as my hired hand if I'm by myself. And if they're laid out in the proper fashion and they're put in the right place, you can do that by getting on that right or left eye and moving cattle up the fence line. So we want to make sure when we design our fencing systems that everything is designed where stuff can move freely because what we're doing, we're taking what used to be maybe millions of acres where buffalo and elk and deer roamed and they actually could move at will and we're trying to put them in a 50 foot, I mean a 50 acre pen or a 50, 100 acre track. We have to incorporate those fences where livestock movement is very easy. So on, on perimeter fences, I like fixed knot fences right now. Fixed knot fence is high tensile. It's probably the best thing going. You can make it better by adding an offset bracket. An offset bracket will have electric running through it on that wire. So you keep the pressure off your good fences and it actually trains livestock. And once you get livestock trained with electric fence, you can do almost whatever you want to with them, put them where you want them, move them, et cetera. So I like to use the fixed knot and also the electric in combination. I like to incorporate curves for better livestock movement. I hardly ever, when we design a fence, unless it's on a perimeter, so if I've got a boundary fence and there's a corner or two, that's fine, I have to do that because when you build a fence, it needs to be on the property line. That's, that's the rule of thumb. Don't ever stick it 10 feet off your property line because you start use, uh, uh, losing land. But I like to incorporate curves so everything flows nice and easy to my catch pins or I follow the contours of my land instead of going straight up hills or straight down hills. I actually fence to where it's easy for livestock movement. How many of you ever seen cattle coming straight off a hill or going straight up a hill? They don't, they don't, they don't move like that. Same thing with horses, cat, or sheep and goats. So I like to incorporate curves for better, better movement. And you can do that with high tensile products. When I say use only high tensile, there's a reason. It's actually a hell of a lot stouter. It's tougher. Lower installation costs with fewer posts, which means it's more economical. Class three or better galvanization is going to last you 30 to 35 years. Wire has greater memory. It won't stretch up to, say, 1%, whereas low tensile stretches 11%. Greater breaking strength, it acts as a vertical trampoline if you have any impact on it. So I like to use high tensile wire like in Virginia, NRCS won't call share on anything but high tensile. If it's low tensile, they won't do it. So high tensile is the best way to go if you're building and designing fences. 
H braces are the foundation of any fence and are critical to the life of your system. Whatever you're doing, and if you're going to those fence schools next week, or if you've, if you've never been to one, you need to go to one because it will go from ground zero up to you can make it as complicated as you like. But when you're building fences, if you're not building proper bracing, I don't care what you're putting up, it's not going to work. It will fail sooner or later. So we really, really focus on brace building and infrastructure. It's like the foundation of a house. If you put in a footing and your footing's not right, your house is not going to be good. So we really focus on this. So that's a big part of fencing for multi-species, knowing what we're trying to keep in or keep out and having the proper infrastructure to make it work. Fixed knot and electric makes a great combination. So you can see right here, we've got a fixed knot fence. Now this is actually in Montana and they were having a lot of trouble with elk, especially during hunting season when they were coming off the mountain, people lined up on the road, popping a cap at them, which is not a good deal. These herds of elk would take off and they were hitting these fences and tearing them up. What we did, we came out, we built a fixed knot fence, and I told them to incorporate some lanes. They, they've got to go somewhere. And instead of going over your fences, I said, let's build some lanes to where they've got a way to get through there. And we'll make the fences that we have up hot by putting an offset bracket. During normal times when they're actually, there's no stress or pressure on them, they'll know that those fences are hot and to stay away from them. But, but by incorporating the lanes, back right in here is normally, I asked the landowner, I said, when they come off the mountain and during hunting season and people start shooting at them, where do they usually cross? He said, they usually cross in an area right here that's maybe three to 400 yards wide because the water's not as deep and it's just a natural game crossing. I said, okay, let's do this. Let's put a lane in right here and not put any fence up. Make everything else hot, and this fall you call me and tell me what happens. He called me after hunting season, he said, Matt, that, it, that was the slickest deal in the world, because when they came off the mountain, they crossed the same place, there was no fence, there was, there was no obstruction, they went right through it and everything was great. So you gotta figure out what animals are thinking, where they're going, and what they're trying to do. Hunters were putting pressure on them. They were going to leave the country. They were going, going to go in the same place. We just made it easy for them to get to the other side. So think about a lot of that when you're laying things out. But knowing these fences were hot kept a lot, a lot of them off of it too. Polywire for subdivision and sacrifice areas. I heard some of you talking about polywire. The best thing to do with multi-species, once you get a perimeter fence and you know you can keep them in, and whatever you don't want in, you know you can keep them out, you've got it made, because you have control of that area, 100 acres, 300 acres, 50 acres, 10 acres, whatever, you've got control of that area. Now what you can do is use polywire, especially if you've got an offset bracket around the perimeter, because that offset bracket is like a water pipe. You're carrying power all the way around your property. So I can go on this end and do whatever I want to do. I can go up on this end and do whatever. I can reseed or uh, do whatever here. I can mow some hay, but I can do it using polywire and keeping animals off of it. If it's multi-species, you may have to use more than one polywire. With cattle, one is fine. If you're using sheep or goats, one's not going to work. You're going to have to use at least a minimum of three and probably five in some cases. So I would use polywire until I figured out something more permanent. Once you figure out something more permanent, then you can start slowly but surely fencing those areas to your liking and also the animal's liking. Not just you, but think about the animal. North facing slopes, south facing slopes, good grass, bad grass, shade, all those things you need to consider. There you go. This just happens to be a place where, you know, the guy had cattle running all over his property. He put some poly wire in, put some offset brackets up, and he said it's the best thing he ever did. He could control kind of where things were going, what they were doing. It made his cattle actually, they, they gentled down just a little bit better. So, you know, that, 
fact, when I went up there, he'd walk in the gate and they'd all take off to the other end. We put some poly wire down the center. We didn't pressure them. Once they got used to the poly wire and knew they got shocked, then they stayed away from it. But they wouldn't run to the other end of the pasture, kind of like Ron was talking about it. There, there was no way you could get in front of them. I mean, like, they stuck their tails up and they were gone. So that slowed them down. These are just some electric fence tips, and I know Jeremy McGill lives up in this country, and Jeremy's a really good guy, works for Gallagher, got some really good ideas, some good thoughts, a lot of good knowledge, but these are just some tips. Number one, you have to select the proper energizer. 110 is better than battery. Anytime you can put up a 110 unit, it's going to be a whole lot cheaper. Solar, a solar panel just keeps the battery charged up. That's all it does. A solar panel does not run the energizer. It just keeps the battery charged. Ground properly using a minimum of three ground rods spaced 10 foot apart. You know, it could be more. Three is a minimum, it could be five or six. I have put in 20 before. Use an offset system to carry power around your property for use in all areas. So once you have a good perimeter fence, always add an offset bracket. It just makes a better system. It's going to keep your fence looking good for the next 30 years. If building high tensile cross fence, never go above 10 inch wire spacing or go below six. You have to shock an animal in their face area. If they get hit behind the ears, where do they go? Right through it. If they get hit in the brisket, where do they go? Right through it. So their nose is where you want that wire to be spaced. On offset brackets, cattle about hip height. If you've got sheep and goats, maybe down a little bit lower, all you have to do is look at those fences and see where the pressure's been put. So look at, look at nose level. Bruce, if you're uh, grazing multi-species, did you need two offsets? No, what I would do if I was grazing multiple species, like sheep or goats or cattle, I would just kind of split the difference because once animals get shocked, they think it goes clear to the moon. They have no idea you know, if they see a wire a little bit further up, like a, a fixed knot wire, they have no idea that it's not hot. You know, it's kind of like me or you. If we touch a hot wire and we go, daggone it, that's, that hurts. If I see some more wire, I'm not going to just go up and grab it to see if it's hot. You know, I'm, I'm thinking in my mind it's going to be hot. So I would, I would, if it's sheep and goats, cattle, like probably about where my thigh is. But I would look at where the pressure points are on the fence. A lot of times in the winter, you can see where cattle have rubbed. If, the, if they haven't had uh, lice treatment or something, you'll see little hairballs. Same thing with sheep or goats. So, and goats are bad about climbing. You know, they'll, they'll, climb, they'll climb a tree. And, and on a fixed knot fence, they'll climb, a, they'll climb a fixed knot fence just like they would a ladder. So you've got to space those things accordingly. If building high tensile cross fence, like I said, never go and never go below six. If you go below six, you get induction. So if you're going, electricity is like water on a pond. It's always evaporating. So some of you will see wires that are hot and you can't explain it. How many of you have ever touched a gate that's hot? And you go, nothing's touching. How can it be hot? It's induction. So if I can take a, a smart fix, which actually measures energy, and electric uh, fence companies sell them. On a perfect day with some moisture, I can, if this is the fence line right here, I can, I can put that right here and it'll start reading voltage. It'll be real high voltage. I can back off to about right here and it's still reading voltage. Now it's going down and you go, how can it be? It's induction, it's evaporating. So a lot of people look at cattle or horses and horses are the most they're, they're easy to figure out because they've got iron tack on their feet, which means they're grounded good. Everybody says livestock smells electricity. They don't smell anything. They're picking up that current that's coming off of this fence. So you'll see cattle go up and do this right here and not touch it, but then they'll back off. You'll see horses do the same thing. Like if you're riding through a gate that's, that's been hot and they know that that gate could be hot, they kind of scoot right through it. So that's, it, it, it's induction. So a gate, when a gate is shut, it's in series with the fence. If you can talk your hand and get now the pickup truck to open it up, that's good, because most of the time they won't. But, but when you open up the gate, once the gate breaks that circuit, it's not hot anymore. When you shut it back, it's hot again. That's induction, so what you do with that, 
is you go to where your gate gungeons are or your hinges and on that bottom one you have a you have a nut and you also have a washer just undo the nut take you a piece of high tensile wire about two feet long make you a little loop slide it over the washer put your bolt back or your nut back put your wire in the ground and it takes that stray voltage right to the ground so your gate won't be hot anymore so there's a lot of things you can do that are like that make all the wires hot in this country make every wire you have up here hot don't do a hot ground system a hot ground system is a hot wire a ground wire a hot wire a ground wire a ground wire is tied into ground rods just because you put up a hot wire another wire that wire that you have right there is neutral if you do a three wire fence and you have a hot wire a ground wire that's not tied into ground rods and you have another hot wire that second wire is a neutral wire and it'll always be hot because of induction you don't need a hot ground system in this country you need a hot ground system in Arizona Texas Montana Wyoming so make all your wires hot tie all the wires together at each end this creates a great big water pipe you have to have that with the electric fence Use good quality insulators for long life. Stay away from steel T-posts if possible. Use heavy duty underground lead out cable designed for power fence. Don't use cable to use in this building to hook your power up. It won't work that way. The energizer will blow a hole in it real quick. Use mixed metal polywire or tape for better conductivity. That's polywire like you're using for strip grazing. It's 50 times more conductive than regular or stainless steel product and you can carry a lot further with it and it shocks animals a lot harder too. Don't tie poly wire together. What you have to do is strip back the poly, strip, uh, tie your little wires together, just burn the poly off of it and you're good. Use cut off switches at gates or paddocks for easier maintenance to, uh, or to find faults. So if you've got multi-species and you've got goats getting out or whatever, you can't walk the whole, if you've got 500 acres of fencing and you've got electric fence up, you don't want to be looking for a short all day. If you can add a cutoff switch in various places, then you can just go cut off several sections and you can isolate those shorts. You have to do that. A lot of people are getting away from electric fence now because it's the maintenance. The maintenance is, I mean, it takes so long to keep things maintained, so you have to make it a whole lot easier. Get a voltmeter or a fault finder. You have to have a voltmeter. You can't go out and lick your arm and see how many hair stands up or take a piece of grass and touch it. You can't tell what voltage is on it. So you need to have a fault finder or a voltmeter. Make sure your animals are trained before you kick them out. If you don't, you're going to have issues. You can't take cattle from the Parker Ranch like Ron was talking about and turn them in a 50 acre trap because you'll never find them again. They're gonna be in the next county over. Anything, if you have electric fence for a perimeter fence or even if you have cross fences, you need to stick animals in a lot where they're contained, run a strand of polywire down the center of it, make sure they have feed and water and leave them overnight. Now when you come back the next morning, there's gonna be a half a dozen of them on the other side with they'll be trained. Once you go through it, they're trained. Most of them won't go through it though, because they'll get shocked. I had a, uh, this is funny, when I started my career over in North Carolina, there was a guy that was in the goat business. And this is when electric fences were really starting to get popular and they were using five strands of electric for the perimeter fences and big energizers. So. Uh, I went down and helped him build the fence and it was hot. I mean, it was, you didn't want to get near it. Two days later, he called me back and said, this stuff's not working. I went, what? What do you mean it's not working? I said, it was hot, everything was good. He said, the goats are getting out. They're running right through it. I went, you got to be kidding me. And so I said, well, gra <laughs> grab the lead goat and put a chain around his neck. So when he goes through it, the chain gets hot. He said, that doesn't work either. He said, I've already thought about that. So I go down a week later, and he stuck the goats back in this, it was about a five acre trap. Stuck the goats in, he ran them through the gate, and it wasn't two minutes later, they were busting through the fence. And I went, this thing can't be hot. 
So I checked it, and it was like, it was fright Because when they, before they even hit it, before they even got near it, they were squealing. And when they went through it, they squealed louder, and when they got through it, so I got to looking at them, and it's all about, it's all about putting pressure on them and stress or whatever. But when they got through it, guess where they were heading? He had taken an old doghouse that the goats used to stand on out of the pen and the goats were heading straight to the to the dog to the dog house and I said well heck I got this figured out he goes I hope you do because I'm getting ready to tear this thing down he, I said take the dog house and put it back in the pen he said you're crazy I said let's try it we put the dog house back in the pen goats never got back out they never got out but they were that was their comfort zone they they actually, when they got out, they went straight. It was a big dog. It was a big dog house. They jumped on top of it. You know how like goats like to get on top of stuff. They jumped on top of it. But we were putting pressure on those goats, and it was screwing with their mind because the dog house wasn't in the lot. So you can build fences, electric fences, and if you can't figure out what these animals want to do or where they want to go, you're going to have a problem. But it was something as simple as sticking that doghouse back in that, in that lot that made it work. And they never got out again. He said, man, that was the smartest thing I've ever seen. So everybody in the county got to talking about the dog, you know, the guy that was the goat whisperer or whatever. Like, about five minutes. Yep, not very appealing. How would you like to drink out of that? You know, that's just, that's just because we haven't maintained stuff. I hate seeing stuff like that. Number one, it was built too close to the fence. The fence is off to the right. They had a feed bunk right here where that uh, slab is. And just look at that. The water leaks. I mean, that's just not very appealing. Water is the most essential nutrient in the livestock grazing system, whether it's multi-species. You don't want to do the left side. You want to do the right side. A lot of people now are using Mirafount waters, uh, any type, frost-free type deal. The water is usually 53 degrees in the tank, so in the winter it's good, in the summer it's good, and you're going to put stress on livestock if you don't have good water, good feed, et cetera, no matter what you've got in there. The left side, continuous grazing, look, no grass, no clean water, it's just a mess. Best if installed in the middle of the grazing paddocks or pasture layout, like waters. I don't like putting water systems in a fence line. It just puts stress on the fences. It really does. I don't care what species you've got in there, having it right on the fence line, if you're trying to work water from both sides, really puts a lot of stress on the fence. Put your waters out in the middle of pasture where the, the manure and urine is evenly distributed. I, that's, that's what I've always done. It works better, and cattle, cattle aren't having to travel so far to get the water. Good management, good sod on higher ground, like if you're feeding cattle, feed on, feed on higher spots. You know, keep them away from the fence lines. I always see people when they feed stuff, if it's cold and nasty, they want to drop it right in front of the gate. Horse people, and I, there's probably some in here, and I, I, my daughters, when they were growing up, we always had a lot of horses. I said, do not feed them at the gate, and they wouldn't. But you see a lot of people feed in areas just to make it convenient for us. This is rolling out haylage bells instead of hay rings. So when we feed, instead of cattle just laying right where you're, you've rolled your hay bells out, run a strand of poly wire. If you've got an offset bracket around your fence, run a strand of poly wire right down the center of where you've rolled out your hay so they're feeding from both sides and they've got their head down and eating it instead of laying in it or whatever. So there's a lot of different things you can do when you have power around your around your permanent fence. And you can do that with sheep, goats, cattle, horses, whatever. It works on all species. Good fence, good feed, good water, no stress. That's a fixed knot fence. They've got good grass. Uh, calves look good. You know, they those those youngsters are having a time right there. Cows are doing good. Everybody's everybody's happy. Keeping the predators out, keeping them in, we know they're there. Couldn't be any better than that. Observations. All you got to do is look, read, and, and this is the thing about going to Ron and Kurt Stockmanship Clinics. You learn to read livestock. And reading livestock, is, is, it, is it the twitch of an ear? Is it the movement of, of their head? 
is the way their body motion is. But right off the bat, these cattle are cold. It was a cold day when I took these pictures. They're standing in the mud, which is not good. Plus, they're standing up against the building to get away from the wind, and that building is warm. These cattle over here, the hay was stored inside this hoop building. They're about to tear the building down to get some food to eat. That's not good. So those are observations, and if you watch animals, you can figure out what they need, and you can figure out how to fence for them. You can figure out how to feed them. You can figure out how to water them, but you have to watch them. A lot of people don't look at them. They turn them out, and they leave them, and they think everything's okay, but they're not. In summary, plan your system taking into consideration long-range goals and objectives with wildlife or livestock. Study topography, animal movement, shade, north and south facing slopes, native grasses, weeds, improved ground, working pens either permanent or portable and keep them on high ground if possible. I see people stick working facilities down in holes where it stays wet and nasty, which is crazy. Public, the public, get this now, the public expects us to be good stewards to animals nowadays. We are in the spotlight every day on how we manage and handle our critters. So you need to be careful. Build good solid braces. Install the fence properly. Use electric for economical cross fence. Use good clean source of water. Seek forage advice. And this was a slide from Virginia Tech. Either Virginia Tech or people like Chris or the University of Kentucky, you have a lot of good people here, a lot of good resources, a lot of good stuff that you can feed off of, and there's a lot of options available. With that, any questions? Yes, sir. Well, in the winter, south facing slopes are warmer. You'll always see, you'll always see livestock. If you watch wildlife, if you go to Wyoming or Montana and you're looking at elk herds that are wintering, they'll always be on a south facing slope. There's always less snow, there's some forage. It's the same thing when you start fencing your pastures. There's going to be, a, there's going to be pastures that do better in the winter versus others that don't. A north facing slope always stays cold, always stays snowy, and sometimes the forge is not there. So when I'm looking, when I'm looking at helping people lay out their properties, I look at water, I look at forage, I look at shade, I look at the way the land lays, how cattle have been moving. All I have to do is see where those cattle trails are or horse trails and how things move. It's no different than me, me and you. We're not going to walk straight up a hill or straight down a hill. We're not going to walk through brush all the time. So I try to figure out animal movement, and then I actually lay out my fences to where animals can move a lot easier. Trying to keep all the corners out of it too. Gate placements. So if I have a, if I have a pasture that's 50 acres and I've got a cross fence, I don't put one gate at one end. I go to the other end and put another gate. Because if the cattle are up here, why do I need to move them all the way back down this fence line when I can let them out right here? So there's a lot of things I'll look at. Yes, sir? I know you didn't mention it, but what's your thoughts on using electric netting or something like that? Repeat the question. My thoughts on using electric netting on sheep. Well, there's a couple things I there's a couple things I don't like, especially for sheep and goats on netting or wire in general. So we have fixed knot products that are have different different vertical spacings. I don't like using six inch stuff for sheep and goats because if they get their head in, a lot of times they can't get their head out. So with netting, the netting, depending on the wire spacing, which is poly wire, if it's six inches and it's not hot and they get in it, they're going to have a hard time getting back out of it because they'll stick their head in it and they won't pull it right back out. If it stays hot, it's probably okay. If it lays on the ground where it's shortened out a lot, you don't have a lot of control. 
but if you can keep it up off the ground a little bit and train those animals, it's probably okay. But if you put a lot of pressure on, they try to jump it, they're going to get tangled up in it. Are you using it right now? Uh, no, but I've just thought about just it. Just playing with it? Yeah. yeah. And, and they're not as much fun as, as uh, the advertisement makes them out to be. They're kind of difficult to move. They're, they're, they're a lot of trouble to move, yeah. But if you get something hung up in it, if, if something gets hung up in it, it's a train wreck. All right, thank you very much.